They made a charge. Two of the summer's most highly anticipated films, Barbie and Oppenheimer, taking the internet by storm. Are people going Oppenheimer Barbie or Barbie Oppenheimer? How fans are getting ready for the big opening weekend known as Barbenheimer. Today, Wednesday, July 19th, 2023. Celebrating Larry's birthday. Today I turned 12. On a mother-son trip from, from Concord, Massachusetts. Shout out to my LS baseball team in Pleasanton, California. Shout out to Mason, Ohio. Toronto, Florida. And Ferndale, Michigan. My brother and sister back in Portland, Oregon. Love, Love you, Minnie and EJ. From Chesapeake, Virginia. Virginia. I've been watching today for 50 years. Yay! Back now, 813 with our ongoing series. It's Today Summer Savings. When it comes to travel, a recent survey found 80% of likely summer vacationers are changing their plans because of inflation. So how can you get some R&R &R without busting your budget? Well, Vicki is here now to show us. Okay, yes, Vicki, some people are still in the planning process, getting yeah. ready to plan their vacation. What should they know? Okay, so here's how I look at the travel picture. It's sort of like a combo platter right now. Some things you're gonna love, some things maybe not so much. The good news, airfare is actually down almost 19% oh. from June of last year. This according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Lodging though, up 5%. But on the car rental front, that's actually down 12.5%. Remember what a zoo it was? to try to rent a yeah. car yeah. last summer. It's much better now. The average cost for a family of four to go on a vacation, still mm -hmm. hovering right around $4,500, according to Credit Donkey. And the top destinations, Europe, Hawaii, and the Caribbean, you're going to have to hop on a plane. So the overall takeaway is plan, do your homework, because you're going to need to to find the best deals. Okay, so okay. we want to save money, Vicki, but we don't want to sacrifice the fun yes. while we're doing it. What are some tips? The first thing to do, Willie, look at all of your credit cards, any kind of rewards plans, all of the bonus points and miles. Take stock of what you have. You might be close enough to getting a free ticket if you mm -hmm. maybe just spend 50 bucks and buy some extra miles, so that's the first thing. The other thing, though, consumer credit uh, checkbook says mm -hmm. don't only rely on those miles. Sometimes if you just shop directly through the airlines and hotels, you might be able to find some great deals, but always look at the fees because you might see that first initial $59 one-way ticket and think that's a great deal. By the time you choose a seat and you want to actually yes. sit down and, and check the bag, right. yeah. that, that yeah. fee could be way higher. Uh, look for last-minute deals. Travel site Hopper says even though you can book up to 11 months in advance and usually booking in advance will ensure you a lower price, these days if you have any flexibility, last-minute deals are pretty good. And then finally, there are apps. Google Flights, Hopper are great for checking and tracking uh, domestic flights. Kiwi is one to check out if you're looking for international flights. Okay. Looking okay. for a spot to stay in. Most people go traditional hotel, motel, but there are other yes. ways you can save money. So you know how you can actually cut your lodging costs in half, huh. Ben Willie? In half? Your two families could travel together and do an oh Airbnb. Let's, yes, oh. there you go, right? If yes. your kids get along, if the parents get along, that can be a great way to save money. Yeah? yeah. And you get a kitchen, so you can switch nights cooking because the average family spends $132 on food, and that's a low conservative yeah, estimate, right? Say. But if you can cook, you're also going to be saving money there. Look for homes. If you're going somewhere by the water, do they also have stand up paddle boards for you? Do they have any kayaks, mm -hmm. any bikes that you can use? built-in activities, those are free. This is a big one, home swapping. It's a growing trend. Maybe you wanna to go to Palm Springs, somewhere warm for the winter, someone else wants to experience the Christmas tree at 30 Rock. You swap homes That's for the so holidays crazy. or whenever, yeah. but home exchange, home link, two sites you can check out there. And then always, if you're going hotels, hotel prices fluctuate wildly right up until the day that you're going to check in. So there's an app called Provo that will help you keep track of that. You can always cancel and rebook at the lower price and look for those free amenities like breakfast. Yeah. Sometimes you can load up and maybe skip lunch mm -hmm. and then just buy dinner. So if you don't buy rent a vacation home that has a kitchen, you're dining out. How do we save money doing that? So do a little homework ahead of time. See where your destinations are. Are there any chain restaurants or mom and pops that may be offering specials? Don't forget our seniors, folks in the military, Kids eat free on some mm -hmm. days, and even if you bring your student ID, sometimes you can find discounts when you're eating out. This is one. Skip the appetizer, skip dessert, or if the appetizers are really big where you're going, split that, yeah. make it your meal. Could be healthier too. Um, we always know that alcohol adds a lot to the bill. So try a happy hour, or if you can, bring your own beer, bring your own alcohol to the restaurant. And finally, there's this app that I really like. It's called Too Good To Go. It works great for college students, but any big city, 
this is a way to cut down on food waste and also get discounts on a lot of food mm -hmm. from bakeries and cafes to actual restaurants. They are trying to get rid of food that is still good to eat, safe mm. to eat, but maybe they have excess and you okay. are trying to get a good deal. Good idea. All right. A lot of people know the destinations we're used to going to, but maybe there's some other off the beaten path ones that may be cheaper. Yes. Well, think closer to home, right? Quebec City or Montreal instead oh, yeah. of France. That you guys had a great time there. You still we got did. a little Parisian sort of uh -huh, experience, uh -huh. right? Um, Florida maybe instead of the Bahamas. Then think about ski resorts in the summer. They actually offer hiking and biking junior ranger programs for the kids to keep them busy. So that's a way to kind of capitalize cool, yeah. on an off-season place. Phoenix, it's so hot. Al's been talking about it. You've been talking about it like what a billion days yeah. over 110 degrees yeah. now it's yeah, been. Yeah. But they have air conditioning. They have resorts with water slides and pools. And this is their off season. So great deals there. Finally, you think about national parks. 312 million people visited national parks last year. Google has this whole new slew of features that helps you download maps, plan the best entrances and exits and on all of their features. But don't forget about your in-state parks. You can buy a season pass for the whole year and get into some of these state parks and use your discounts, military and senior. All good. Yeah. Great. Don't She's you love amazing. Vicky? Vicky's incredible. Incredible. Thanks, Vicky. <laughs>
I think they're going to be the favorites to uh, win the World Cup and become the first team in history, men's or women's, to three-peat in this championship. I think they have a very good squad with very exciting young and upcoming players that have shown that can play at this level. And I really like their chances to go all the way to the final. Andres, if we can move the, the news and the questions over back here to the U.S., Messi is now in Miami. The city has mm -hmm. completely gone nuts. How big of a moment do you think this is, not only for Miami, but really for, for soccer in America? Is this the moment sort of everyone looks back and says, finally now America is on the map in America, yeah, soccer's on the map in America? Well, MLS was able to uh, bring a world champion six months, or actually yesterday was seven months, detached from him winning the World Cup in his prime, even though he's uh, 36. And I think this is huge news, and there will be a before and after Messi. You've seen the, you know, the Messi effect, not only in Miami, but throughout all the cities where uh, the MLS teams have sold out the away games of Inter Miami. So this is great for the sport. Uh, it's great, you know, for the exposure of Major League Soccer. So it's 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 awesome that he's here or over there in the States uh, and will be for the next couple of years. Andres, also great for the game of soccer, your voice yeah. <laughs> and the way you call a goal. So what are you doing to get ready for the World Cup? Actually, I'm going to try to get some sleep. I yeah. got here uh, <laughs> yesterday morning. We're, I believe, 14 hours ahead. I need to catch up on my sleep and be ready for tomorrow, my tomorrow, for Norway against New Zealand. Uh, I'll be there for Telemundo and Peacock, of course. And then on Friday, prime time on our country, I'll be more than ready. <laughs> uh, I remember back in 2019, the first game of the U.S. was against Thailand, and it was 13-0. So I don't know what the score will be against <laughs> Vietnam, but I am ready. Uh -huh. Okay, well, get your rest. We need you with your A game like you always have it. Andres Thanks, Cantor, Andres. thank you so much. <laughs> Telemundo and Peacock are home of the Spanish language coverage of the World Cup, which begins tomorrow. And as Andres mentioned, you can catch Team USA's first match. That's Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. We cannot wait as they go good. for the three yeah. Pedo. Right. Absolutely. And we're back with the story behind one of the world's most celebrated artists. Yeah, Monet's paintings are worth millions. And Kier, you got a chance to visit the place where he was inspired mm -hmm. with some of this beautiful landscape. Yeah, absolutely. You know, even if you don't know, you know Monet, you know Monet. You mm -hmm. only have to look at that incredible canvas, of the water leaves, and immediately you're transported to the place where he did all of his work. Well, you know, guys, mm -hmm. we got to go there. 
Mm. It's incredible. Mm. America fell in love with this picturesque corner of the French countryside more than a century ago. It was home to Claude Monet, where he painted for 40 years, a time they called La Belle Epoque. This beautiful uh, dining room, it's all painted yellow. My guide, Ariane Cordelier, says Monet adored colour. His house is sort of a palette in itself. Look at this room. Ha! This is his studio. It was, yes, and it is still exactly like in Monet's times. Paintings that we know and love <laughs> all around us. Even Monet's bedroom is a shrine to the Impressionist painting he epitomized. Renoir, Cezanne. What a view to be able to wake up to. Under his strict instructions, a team of gardeners created a living canvas of plants and flowers, and most of all, of course, his lily ponds. Monet created this place so he could paint it. Imagine how many millions of us have seen it through his eyes. Monet painted directly from life, that was the way with the Impressionists. This paradise for painters continues to inspire artists today. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Like American Just Eric Santoli on. from New Why? Jersey. Just everywhere you look is, is, is a perfect painting. It's a beautiful place. For Fellow artist Patricia rinsky dargence says it was America that first recognized the magic of Monet. So right from the beginning, Monet's success looked to America. Exactly. And then uh, some American painters came to France. They stayed here, in the village, at the Hotel Bode, a lively, thriving colony of American Impressionists. And this was their studio, a little piece of American history across the pond. The big pond. I mean, the Atlantic. Since then, millions of Americans have crossed the pond to see his water lilies here in Paris and to visit the real thing in his gorgeous gardens at Giverny. It's just beautiful. An idyllic vision of France, as vivid today as ever. His theory was, I want to paint what I can see, but he had a superpower. He didn't see as we do. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Isn't that right. so oh French? Gosh. You know, it's a year to go to the Olympics. We have the opportunity this year to celebrate France, and yeah, what an in incredible I mean, place it the is. The idea yeah. that he created it so he could paint it is yeah. so wow. incredibly that, moving mm. and beautiful. Yeah, really, really wonderful. And I should just say, if, yeah. if you aren't able to get to France, yeah. I, and I recommend it and, and go there. <laughs> that immersive experience, that Monet immersive, immersive experience, it's next in St. Louis. So. Oh, that's oh, great. Yeah. It's been here. It's been in New York for a while. Kind yeah. of the way it's they cool. did with Van Gogh and some of the other yeah. ones, right? You go in right. and surround yeah. When you toured that, did you see any paintings of dogs playing cards? <laughs> <laughs> Real yes. masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny that. <laughs> How funny you should you know that. I just, I could sense it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank here, you. Thank Thanks, you. Here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Up next, Martha Stewart sharing her recipe for spicy lobster with mm. linguine. Mm. And we're going to pick the meat ourselves. Mm. A little help from Martha. But first, this is today on NBC. That was
everybody drool. We're making a delicious lobster dish. It would not be summer without a lobster dish or two, but picking the meat can be kind of tough. It can be tricky, messy. So we brought in the expert, the great Martha Stewart, to show us how it's done. Martha, good morning. Good, good to morning. see you. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Hi. How so are I, you? I feel like at a restaurant, if it's not already cracked, it kind of turns people off to it. Yep, it but does. when you're at home with a lobster, how do you start? Well, first you have to cook it. Okay. okay. Sure. And then you have to uh, take it apart. A lobster should be well cooked, not overcooked, not undercooked. How do you okay. know when it's well cooked? Uh, well, it's uh, by time. Yeah. It's, uh, usually about 13 minutes for 13 a pounder, uh, 18 minutes for a pound and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes right out of the hot water, okay. then uh, if it's a hard shell, it's a little hard to do. I like to snip off the tips with yeah. scissors, with scissors, and okay. shake it and get all that excess water out. You know. Oh. Sometimes you, you sit with your plate full of water, right? Yes. But uh, you get drip it out. Then, uh, when it's cool enough to pick up, uh -huh. twist off the claws from the okay. base, right? From yep. the bottom. right here, okay. right from the body. Okay. This one's okay. not coming out very well. Okay. And then twist off the tail very okay. carefully. Yeah. Okay. Yep, that's What's this stuff off. inside, Martha? Oh, that's tamal and roe. Okay. And, and some people get ooh, and I have a lot of ink. But you want to, you have to just ignore that because people get turned away. Yeah. Yes. You can dip that out. Just wipe it out. Okay. Yeah. Wipe it off. Yeah. Well, you can also cut it out if you okay. want. Just pull it with a fork. Okay. Oh, well, mine has a lot. Wait. I don't think. There. And you can rinse it too. So you're and then, that, then if you want to oh. know how to get the uh, get, oh god get the um, lobster out of the tail, yes. yeah, just. Stir it. it like that, and then put your fork, um, insert a, a big fork right under the shell here. Okay. See, all the way down, and then pull. Okay. Okay, and wait just a second. Meat out, twist, it. twist and pull, and the whole tail should come right out. Look. Wait, twist and See pull. how it comes? Yeah. Yep. Anyone right else there. getting it like Martha? Mine, no. mine, is, not mine not is not cooked well enough. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Where's that cooker? Oh boy. Oh boy. I'm not happy about Somebody's my in lobster. Trouble. Okay. And I, then. Anyway, okay. <laughs> oh, I got it. I got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I got some of mine. Yes. Much nicer. Mine okay. is kind of a mess. But um, uh, now take your clip, uh, your crackers. You can have okay. these big, heavy yeah. crackers okay. and crack the claws. Okay. Where are you cracking yeah. it? Right okay. on the widest part. Widest part. part. Wow. I need Willie Geist. You need some help? Mojo over here. Oh. Yeah, here. And then break this oh. off. Time. Take out the little, the little claw. I clearly and you'll am be able to dig out. <laughs> Are you doing it okay? I've got it. Yeah. Yeah, yours is much. Really? I've got a good one. Off. I've got I a good got one. It. I'm just watching Martha. I'm following her I lead. took okay. that big claw, the big lobster, and you know oh what? God. I like <laughs> pound and quarter. Uh, Al is manhandling okay. his lobster down uh, there. Right. And now take that nice there meat out. There we go. There we go. Put the meat in the bowl. Right. And then most of the meat's coming from the claws, though, right, Martha? No, most comes from the tail. Exactly. And then. <laughs> yeah, like you that, said. That's what yeah. you said. That's what I and meant. then take out all the out of the knuckles. You I like the piece. knuckle meat a lot. Um, mm. All of these little pieces. I don't know, waste knuckles. it. Put that in your bowl. How are you doing? You're doing. You're, yours is the best. I think we're going. Willie yeah, is going well. the best. Willie, Willie has got it. it. Well, he has the best lobster. I have a great teacher. Would you mind? Too. Yes. Okay. 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 And then, then you can also, you know, crack along the the rest of the claw. And <laughs> so we've extracted. Yes. Yeah. And then look um, at Tom. I want you to look at Tom's plate. Yeah, Martha. we have like a lot, a lot going Tom. on here, Martha. Judges. Poor Tom. I, I can't really hear you that well, so I think I've destroyed this lobster. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. You have your lobster. Linguini already made for yeah, you. Yeah, let's right go to here. that. Yeah. And now the lobster linguini is delicious. You'll need a That's can good. of tomatoes. Okay. The, and then you have you saute a little bit of garlic in yeah. olive oil. Uh, add the tomatoes, a little bit of freshly chopped mint, uh, red hot peppers, salt pepper, and you have and you stir in your lobster meat. Mm. And it looks beautiful. Enjoy. By the way. Good. This it is really does. A beautiful, beautiful dish mm. called spicy lobster yeah. linguine. Oh my gosh. How does it taste? Oh Delicious. Oh, oh good. good. Yummy. Oh. Mm. Yes. This Willie so gets good. the prize for the best yeah, lobster. Well, you get well. yeah. Yeah. There you go, Thank Willie. You. Wow. It's an honor. That is Bravo. amazing. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Martha. Martha. You That's can buy Martha's recipe. What about the lemonade? Oh, you got to have oh, lemonade oh, for summer. Of course you have to have lemonade. There, there's over here. Would you like mm -hmm. me to get that for you? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, Tom, we're going to get some lemonade Come going over. here. While we mm, tell you that you yeah. can find Martha's Ooh, recipe at today.com slash shop. And of course, check out the Martha Stewart podcast well. available mm. wherever you get yours. Martha, right. thank you. Thank Martha, you. happy summer. Oh, Great yes. to see you. Mr. Rooker, you want to celebrate some birthdays? You got some yeah. Smucker's jars Oh, Absolutely. Us? They're making a lobster-flavored jam. It's pretty good. <laughs> First up, a very special happy birthday to Mr. Tom Wiley of Pittsburgh, PA. Served as a B-17 pilot during World War II. We salute you for your service, sir. Kay Lynch, 111 grandma from Port Washington, New York, 15 grandkids, 19 great grandkids, and three great, great grandkids on the way. Wowzers. Happy 100th birthday to Benjamin Middleton, a karaoke singer from Beaufort, South Carolina. Managed an 18 piece big band orchestra until his early 90s. Wow, Arlene Morrow of West Windsor, New Jersey, also 100, known as the mayor at her assisted living community because she knows how to show those new tenants around. Yadja Vignaisky of Princeton, New Jersey, 100. She ran the engineering library at McGill University, beloved by her students. And last but not least, little history. Happy 100th birthday to Robert Williams of Philadelphia, one of the oldest living members of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, receiving the Congressional yeah. Gold Medal. Yeah. We thank you for your service, sir. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. By the way, we do still have a couple of birthdays out here. Uh -huh. We saw this lovely lady who's turning 90. What's your name? Lara. And how old are you today? 12. We got 12-year-old Lara. Wow. And who else is celebrating a birthday? <laughs> Donna. And how old are you? 21. Yes! Way to go, Donna! Any other birthdays? We got one more. We come on. When you come here, you get to celebrate with us. What's your name, honey? My name's Dylan. And you're turning 12? Dylan's turning wow. 12. Look at that. Man. Hey. Anyway, Woo. don't you love when people I come and that. celebrate big milestones yeah, out yeah. here on the That's show? Why we're, they come. we're so we happy. All right, guys, ahead on our fourth hour, the hottest new beauty trends. It's called skin streaming. Ooh. Ooh. But first of the third hour, is your phone running out of storage or your emails out of control? We're gonna walk you through a much needed digital cleanup. We're gonna show you how to do it. But first, your local news. And a lobster cleanup. Yes. 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 Woo. Guys. I mean That's messy. everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. <laughs> the boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. This morning on the third hour of today, second chance. When you get saved, you feel like you, you want to live. So I'm very grateful. The sailor who says he spent three months lost at sea, opening up about the ordeal, how he survived, and his first mate who helped him through it. Then, feeling lucky. Lottery dreams could come true this week with two giant jackpots, including one worth a billion dollars the long odds and numbers that keep popping up plus it's a summer party first in our style file fun looks for the whole family to keeping you looking cool at the pool the backyard or anywhere you go then what's a party without food chef laura vitale's got two fresh and easy summer recipes hardest part 
Which one do you make first? Today, Wednesday, July 19th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everyone. It is the third hour of today. Craig is off, and we've got Chanel and Al here. So, Al, what day is it? Hump day! Hey. Mike, 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 Mike. Craig would be proud. <laughs> Happy yes. Hump Day. All right, well, we have a big hour lined up for you today, and we begin with that remarkable rescue in the middle of the Pacific. We are learning new details today about the sailor who says he was swept out to sea for three months. Can you imagine with his dog? He arrived back on land yesterday and shared much more about how they survived. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is live for us. Good morning to you. Hey guys, good morning. Tim Shattuck appeared to be in a dire situation before he was rescued by a fishing crew. He and his dog Bella only had each other as weeks turned to months as they were lost at sea. Fearing the end could be near, he says he was saved just in the nick of time. Disembarking his rescue ship with a warm embrace for the team who saved him. This morning, Tim Shattuck is the sea wary castaway who's now sharing his harrowing story of survival with the world. When you get saved, you feel like you, you want to live. So I'm very grateful. After being lost at sea for nearly three months, the Sydney sailor indebted to the fishermen who plucked him out of the ocean. I'm alive and, uh, and, uh, uh, I did, really didn't think I'd make it. Discovered bobbing some 1,300 miles off Mexico's west coast, Shattuck, who was stranded at sea with his new dog, Bella, was reeled in by a tuna trawler after he was miraculously spotted by a helicopter working with a ship. Shattuck says he and Bella survived for months by drinking rainwater and eating a diet of raw fish. So it was a lot of tuna, you know, sushi, and I'm still very skinny. By the time I came here to the fishing boat, I was just eating so much food. <laughs> Just weeks into their three-month voyage from La Paz, Mexico to French Polynesia, Shattuck says a storm wiped out all the electronics aboard their catamaran. Holding on to each other, they survived against the odds. She's a beautiful animal. I, I'm just grateful she's alive, you know. Uh, she's, she, she's, a bit, she's a lot more braver than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> The two drifted for months, never knowing if a lifeline would come. I would try and find the happiness inside myself, you know. Things get tough out there, uh, you know, you have to survive. This morning, the castaway back on land, but saying he'll never give up new adventures at sea. Tim actually met Bella in Mexico just before they shoved off for the journey. He said she was homeless and she wouldn't stop following him, so he brought her on board the boat. Little did they know they'd be in for a journey of a lifetime together, guys. Mm. Mm. Wow. Everything happens for a reason, Miguel. Yeah, that goodness. was terrific. Thanks wow. for sharing that. Thank you. That's crazy. Isn't that amazing? The poor Three dog's months. probably like... Yeah, that's right. a lot of uh, At least I was on land before. I mean, day. <laughs> but, you know, thank, thankfully they found each that's other. That's sweet. Yes. That's beautiful. Bonded well, for life. Yes, you talk about luck. That, yeah. That's one lucky guy and dog. Well, if you're feeling lucky this morning, maybe you want to take a chance and play your favorite numbers. Why? Because there was not one, there's not one, but two jaw-dropping jackpots. The Mega Millions is worth $720 million. <laughs> but tonight's Powerball, the bigger one, a cool billion dollars. NBC's Maggie Vespa following the lotto fever. So uh, it just seems like these things just get bigger and bigger, Maggie. Yeah, Al, they definitely do. You're exactly right. A lot of people have that impression and they're right on the money, so to speak. In fact, the proof is in this sign. Look at this, you know, kind of dated, uh, optimistic, we'll say, but clearly dated Powerball listing of $1 million. That's because until a couple years ago, a billion was never something anybody was predicting. But if you look at the recent records that have been established, you can see the all-time record now of $2.04 billion. That was set last year. That was in November. Then behind that, number two, $1.59 billion in 2016 and now we are with a billion in 2023 that would be the third all-time record the reason these are so much higher is that in the past decade mega millions and powerball both basically changed the way the game is played and they made it so that there's a wider array of numbers you have to choose from when filling the five slots on your ticket it used to be 
for Powerball 1 to 59. Now it's 1 to 69, and that made the odds of winning much slimmer. So we have that many more drawings with no winner, and then the jackpot just gets higher and higher. But here we are in Skokie, Illinois. Look how lucky this shop is. Isn't this cute? All of these $500 winners at the Illinois Lottery. So there are lucky vibes here, guys, for sure, which, you know, is comforting for someone who just bought this ticket with all random numbers. Our crew has decided we will split this, and we can rope you guys in if you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we're feeling good. I'll send Illinois, you the money, sure. Maggie. Absolutely. We're, we're, Why not? And we've, got, oh, we've got proof here. We're, <laughs> yes. we're in. Here, we we're are send in. You the we're saying it right <laughs> now. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, thanks, Maggie. That's funny. Do you remember when McDonald's, it was used to be like a million served, and then they had to change right. their oh, logo to a B? No, they yeah. should just keep sure. a little, little, little scotch tape, little, <laughs> yeah. little right. mask and tape, put something. that up there and put a little B on it. It's interesting, though, that it's the Powerball and the Mega Millions are both skyrocketing. Like, why does that happen at the same time? Time. I don't know. That maybe has something to do with the moon. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Nailed it. <laughs> well, yeah. Ugh. So smart. Um, turning now to a story that grabbed our attention this morning, and a lot of people are going to relate to this. So, so good news for so-called weekend warriors who don't have time to exercise during the week. Listen to this. There's a new study. This is out of Massachusetts General Hospital. It was published in JAMA, which found that weekend warriors, as they call them, experience similar heart, heart health benefits to those who worked out and spread their workouts over the course of several days. Both groups had similar levels of heart health benefits, lower risks of heart attack, mm. heart failure, and stroke. So here is the goal. As much as we talk about health and wellness on the show and start mm -hmm. today, if you just try to get two and a half hours of moderate to vigorous exercise, no matter how you do it. Per week. Per mm -hmm. week. Like if you have to do it on the weekend mm -hmm. because your weeks are too hectic, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Hmm. So listen, I think that's great news. And look, I think, it, it, listen, it doesn't matter how you get it. Yeah. Right? Walking briskly, you know, to the to the mall or whatever mm -hmm. you do, it, just do it. You get out there. Yeah, yesterday, I had the three boys, and they put this, like, weird patch of grass, mm -hmm. like, you know, turf out on the sidewalk. And I'm, we kept walking by. We're like, what are they doing? Like, what is this for? It's just taking up space on the sidewalk. And then last night, they were just sprinting back and forth oh, on this, like, patch, patch of grass because they wouldn't fall and get hurt. And then I was chasing them, and I'm like, this is my exercise. There this you is go. When I exercise. You find it where you can. Sit Life. Oh, I found a patch of grass. <laughs> it Come was on, long. kids. Let's play. It was very Look at long. it. Look, it's Look like, at this little patch. What play on we... this before the dogs yes. find it. <laughs> like 50, okay. 50 yards yeah. long. All just... right. Now to a hot debate online. Now, we've heard this one before. What, what do you do, or should you do, if someone asks you to switch seats on an airplane? Mm. A woman posted this scenario on TikTok. She claimed someone was already in her window seat when she boarded her flight. It was a mom with two older kids. She estimated they're about 11 to 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So that mom asked her to switch seats so she could stay with the kids, but mm -hmm. she would have to give up her window seat for the middle dreaded seat. middle seat. And she was like, nope, That's sorry. right. Well, now the woman who posted this says she declined because she desperately needed to get some sleep, had a big presentation to give. Mom, the mom wasn't happy and complained loudly. Mm. So what would you have done? Well, I think from the mom's point of view, like if you're in a middle seat, that's you're just out of luck. You can't ever switch no and give up a seat. middle seat right. for a better seat. And it's with just, older kids. With older kids, it's fine. Yeah. She's right behind them. How about she you? Should, and, and, the, and the mom was literally right behind. Yeah, no, I'm, I went through that today because I had to buy my ticket separately from the from the family. So today, this morning, I had to pick my seat, and I'm like, you know what? They're old enough at 11 right. and yeah. 13. They can sit by themselves. And they're thrilled with that. And they're fine with <laughs> they're it. They'll, excited get, they'll about ask it. for soda and more than I would ever give them. They'll ask for head. It'll be sure. fine. And you you get a little break. Yeah. So I just, it, it's, it's a win-win. I'm also conscious of I picked a seat um, towards the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, no, 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 towards the front. And then if I have to switch, at least somebody, if they're sitting in the back, would rather would move sure. up. Absolutely. Like you try to find a seat yeah. that will help yeah. them level It's up. weird, though. We're traveling with Rusty, and it's an infinite arms. Oh. It would be weird if I switched and yeah. left Rusty. Either. Yeah, that would be a Although that would be great for me. I once had uh, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a red eye from L.A. to New York, uh, some rock star's brother and his wife were, were, couldn't sit together. And True I, story. And I said, um, I don't want that middle seat in, yeah. you know, in front of the bulkhead because I had to be on the show that morning. I needed my you sleep. You needed to sleep. And they got upset. The, 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 rock star didn't, the, the rock star's brother didn't. The wife got upset. So Did she, she knew you were Al Roker. Yeah, but I didn't know who they were. So that was, uh, <laughs> and that really annoyed me. <laughs> you threw out it. Don't you know who I am? <laughs> He's like, no, yeah. I don't. <laughs> Excuse me, flight attendant. Could you ask people if they know who this guy is? Because they don't know who they are. Anyway. All right. Well, coming up next, we are doing a digital deep clean. Are you getting those phone storage warnings, your inbox overflowing? We are going to tell you the quick fixes to clean up all of your devices when the third hour of today comes right back.
This morning in our Consumer Confidential, a summer cleanup for our devices. If your phone is full, your desktop is cluttered, your inbox is stuffed, we have some help for you this morning. We have Jason Chin, the deputy editor of Wirecutter, and he's here to help us tidy up. Good morning to you. Hey, Jason. Good morning. Good morning. I have to tell you, sometimes people have mailboxes that are full or things are running slow. Where do you even start? Oh. That's a really good question. Yeah, like, uh, I'm very guilty of this too. Um, yeah. oh, it's what, good to know you are too. Oh, very much so. I would start with doing an audit. You know, you should really mm -hmm. take a look. On your phone or laptop or? Both, okay. both. So take a look at the storage settings, understand where everything is. If you've got a lot of photos, start there. If you've got a lot of music downloaded, get rid of those. And then from there, what you want to do is figure out what to delete. And so. Mm -hmm. Really, there's a lot of stuff in those music files, in those photo folders that you can delete. And then also our downloads are taking up a lot of room. You know, your friend sends you something, mm -hmm. yeah. you download it to your desktop, go there. And then what I would also suggest is start scheduling some cleanup time. Right. Do it once a week, mm -hmm. once every two weeks. You'll, you'll have a lot of peace of mind. And, and a lot of the places to purge that storage, once you do that, that audit, it gives you an idea. You look at your mail, you look at your text, you look at your photos. Totally. Those are the places where you start to really look. That's, that's definitely where you should go. And then on your phone, really, if we're talking specifically about your phone, old text messages, there are a lot of videos in there. You just delete the deleted? You can go to delete, and then the phone will auto-delete after 30 days. Mm -hmm. If you want to get rid of it immediately, you can do it immediately and go mm -hmm. delete the deleted in your yeah. trash bin. Also, go through your old, old text messages because those are people you haven't talked to in maybe two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get rid You're of right. those old photos You're and videos. Right. Why do I even say I'm like that a hoarder. Stuff. I, I am too. Digital we're, hoarder. we're digital hoarders. Yeah. Digital hoarder. I'm also a digital hoarder on the computer too. So, you know, you're looking for the files. You never really want to delete anything. How do you clean up your desktop? Totally. So, after you've gone through everything and figure out what you want to keep, try to create some tags. So we can take a look at my desktop right now, the okay. very sanitized version. <laughs> you can also create some tags on files and folders, just the way hashtags sort of work on mm -hmm. social media. So here I'm creating a tag for work. And so everything related to work, I can bring up as work. And then later on, when I search for that tag, it'll summon everything very clearly. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to just do work. You can do a tag for mom's 70th birthday. You can do a tag for taxes, uh, okay. a personal project. That's an easy way to order. I like if there was good. a business you could, I would pay somebody. <laughs> oh my God. I'm, I'm sure there me. is. Yeah. Can you just help me do that? Yeah. Let's talk about emails. I'm guilty. I have what, 1,001, 2,000 and I guess. <laughs> I'm the worst offender, yes. the same. Because you open it, and then you read it, and you don't think to delete. To you delete. Just yeah. Or yes. well, you're like, I'll get back to it later. hundred exactly. percent. And so, so something easy you can do is we've done a little bit of a demonstration here. This is my email inbox, so mm -hmm. don't look too closely. <laughs> um, but what you can do is type in the word size, colon, and then a file size. Oh. And then it'll bring up every file that's at least that size. Where? In the search? In thing? the search bar. So it works on Outlook. It also will work in Gmail. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see that everything that is two megabytes or bigger, mm -hmm. it will bring right up. And you can go through and delete the old things or you can mm -hmm. if you're really brave select all get yeah all just get rid of it yeah. even in the search box you put size yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. okay the, <laughs> it's a little bit different on outlook on gmail specifically that's how it works but okay. we have some instructions on wire cutter all right sounds good. okay okay so we talk about our phones uh you talk about streamlining our texts yeah so this is actually a, a fun demonstration i can show you right now okay so I think we all know that you can use uh, text shortcuts on your phone. If you type in, say, LMK, it can do a shortcut oh. that turns into let me know. Really? Um, yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> so here, say, if you want to type in oh. LMK, it'll turn into let me know. But something else that's actually pretty cool that I like to do is actually if there's a lot of text that I am typing in often that is a little bit tedious, if yeah. I need it for various forms, for credit card information, oh. what you can do is the next time you need to type that thing in, what you'll do is just type in the shortcut and it'll pull it right up. Oh, wow. So oh, that's, that's not my cool. actual email to try to email me, but yeah, okay. you can do that for addresses, email. It's very, very simple. That's wow. great. That's um, great. Okay, and when it, speaking of the phone, when it comes to apps, yes. what's the difference between just removing them from you know the interface or removing them completely? Totally. So when you get rid of it completely, it gets rid of the storage on your phone and on any iCloud backups of your phone. So it won't take up any more space. Removing it from the phone itself, though, 
uh, via the app home function, mm -hmm. it won't actually get rid of it. It'll just hide it so that if you're on your home oh, screen, okay. you won't be able to see it. So I can show you how to do that now. Delete gets rid of it completely. Right. Mm -hmm. Remove from home screen just means it's gone off the screen. And usually gives you a warning that says this is going to delete all the data. Right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And then if you've removed it only from the home screen, you can actually bring it back up rather easily. Okay. So okay. go all the way to the right to the app library. If you want to find podcasts again, it's right there. Right. Uh, okay. Or you can just bring down your search bar and then type in podcasts. Okay. It's like right there as well, even if it's cool. not on your home screen. That's right. oh, Jason, of, thank you. We've got so many apps on our phones that we haven't used in it's a so year. Oh my God, get rid of them. Take up space. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. That's great. Right, thank right. you so much. Yeah. All right, coming up uh, ahead, it is Wellness Wednesday. Whether you're overscheduled or at FOMO, we are going to tell you how to manage your mental health in the summer. Then later in our style file, cool summer looks for everyone. How to add some color and patterns to your closet. We'll be right back. Summertime and the living ain't always easy. Hectic schedules, routine Uh-oh. changes. Part really, really bad. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> maybe we're all just staying up or too late. This all adds up. So in this morning's Wellness Wednesday, steps to manage our mental health in the summer. With us now, board-certified psychotherapist and author, Nero Feliciano. Nero, good to see good you. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so first of all, you know, it's summertime. That comes with a lot of sunshine. Mm. Talk about the importance for our mental and physical health of vitamin D. Yeah, so first of all, sunscreen, sunscreen. We want the good effects of the mm -hmm. sun, not the bad effects. Right. But we need vitamin D for our energy, but we also need it for our mood, because vitamin D is used to make serotonin, mm -hmm. which is our natural mood elevator, mood balancer, helps us feel calm, and melatonin, which I'm sure you've heard helps us sleep. Yeah. But it's also a powerful anti-inflammatory. So I didn't it helps know that. Yeah, yeah, combat the effects of stress in our body. Mm -hmm. And the Cleveland Clinic recommends that we get eight to 10 minutes around noon of sun mm. every day. Someone like you, Dylan, needs less sun than people like us who are darker skin. Mm -hmm. And they need 25% of our body exposed. And let me just clarify, let's keep that G-rated. We want <laughs> face, neck, arms, hands are fine. But whatever. What <laughs> I have a question. If, let's say you have a really high sunscreen. I actually yes. have heard people ask this. Like, are you diminishing what the sun could do if you're putting on too high of a sunscreen? I know it sounds like a crazy question, but there are people who say, no, I want it to be you know, only go up and absorb it. Yeah, no, you can because when you're absorbing those UVR rays, we're not using the vi to synthesize vitamin D. So that's why short term. But generally, most people can't get out every day at 12. So we need to supplement. But ask your doctor how much you need. All right, okay. fair yeah. enough. So when it comes to FOMO, you know that mm. fear of missing out. You're looking at social media. You're hearing your friends are going to all these parties. How do you get your mind right and feel like you're not missing out on things? It's very real in the summer. But what I like to say, a great vacation does not a great life make. Hmm. We need a lot more than a great vacation mm -hmm. for a meaningful life, and we're only seeing a snapshot of their life. If we knew their challenges, we may not want to change places. But all emotions can be useful to reveal what we really 
desire, FOMO's envy, mm -hmm. but we can look at to see what do we really want mm -hmm. and how do we make that happen in our life? Yeah. Maybe Italy's not in the cards for this summer, mm -hmm. but we can go out and have an Italian dinner with our friends, enjoy a bottle mm -hmm. of wine. And, and it's important to understand that there are things in our life that we take for granted that trigger FOMO in other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's our health, maybe it's our career. Maybe you can keep a house plan alive. You know, I'm just no, trying to keep my kids sure. alive right now. <laughs> so nothing That's a great. Good point. It's important That's to ground point. ourselves in gratitude. And what about the opposite end of the spectrum where you feel like you have to say yes to this event and that mm -hmm. event and you almost feel like you haven't had any time for yourself. That's right. And you know, the problem is we get overstimulated and exhausted for the things we really want to bring our energy and be present. We don't have it. So it's okay to say no. Actually, yes. Mm -hmm. I said this last month. If it's not a let's go, just say no. That helps mm -hmm. us decide what we want to put our time into. And we do need the alone time. I recommend in the morning and what we've seen from the research, it helps us center, ground our Self, self reflection, and that is really important for mood regulation. Mm. Oh, I, I love that. And, so, and don't say maybe to people that yeah, you no, come. Don't give no, them, don't give no. them yes. false hope. Not just sure. tell them no. And it hangs over your head. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. a good point. Nero, thanks so much. Always Thank great you so much. Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, coming up, we are going to help you look cool for the summer. We are sharing prints you will go wild over oh, in our style file for your whole family. And then later, once you dress to impress, Let's eat. We are cooking up a simple summer salad that you'll want to make this weekend, or maybe even tonight. Ooh, right more Cali. Yum. It's time now for our series, Cool for the Summer. And this morning, we're all about looking cool. So we are going to show you how to pull off some bold summer prints. And here to help is fashion journalist and host of the Friend of a Friend podcast, Liv Perez. Liv, good morning. Hi. Hi. Thank you we for always, having me back. We love your looks when you're here. Thank you. And today we're talking about patterns and prints. But I feel like sometimes... You're trying to do too much. So if you want to throw in a pattern, what's an easy rule of thumb? So my number one tip for nailing summer prints is to pick one hero item mm -hmm. and build your look around that. One hero oh. item? One staple item in the entire look. Okay. okay. So okay. pick that one look and build the outfit around it. I like to go for neutrals when it comes to styling prints. Okay. Maybe mix it with a neutral top, neutral bottom, and let that printed look do all the talking. Okay. And I'm going to show you guys some great examples okay. with some Let's of our models. Okay, let's start with our first yeah. trend. Um, is there a right way or wrong way to do stripes? Ooh, I like. Yeah, I like this. So I love stripes. I think they're an essential pattern for every closet. A must have. They're classic and essential. And specifically, I love this J. Crew men's top because I always prefer a vertical stripe versus a horizontal mm -hmm. stripe. I think it really helps to elongate a look. Cute. And for that reason, I also prefer a stripe top versus a stripe bottom for mm -hmm. the same exact reason. Mm. So and I love that blazer. I love this blazer. She looks so chic. This is yeah. a look I could see her wear all summer on repeat, especially over all white. It's mm -hmm. a very like summer approved look. We yeah, say yes great. to both of them. Very yes. nice. Love that. Thank you guys. All right. Thank but and, and that's that's not all we've got. Uh, <laughs> oh, Liv. good one. Uh, thank you very much. And we got uh, Aaron and Christian. Talk about the dots here. So cute. So spots are really my go-to party trick because not only are they an amazing statement piece to be able to wear it to maybe a summer barbecue or a soiree, but they're just so easy and fun. Mm -hmm. Like I love this ASOS dress. She can throw that on with sneakers that. and go so to cute. a lunch meeting yeah. or a, or you know a day at work mm -hmm. and then have heels in her bag and go straight to a date night. My so daughter cute. loves ASOS. She's so good. They have ASOS. so many great pieces. 
pieces. And you know, with spots, I always say, the smaller the spot, the more fashionable and effortless it is. Okay. Which is why for men who might be a little bit print shy, great place to start is here. Great I look I great. I Super understated. And he yeah. can wear this with anything he already has in his closet. And, and look at sneakers. Those sneakers. Yeah. yeah. I love those sneakers. They're Karyuma and they're, they're there just so cool. All right. Those are really yeah. cool. Thank you guys. You look great. You guys Thank look you. really good. I love Animal this. prints are always fun for kids, yes. but adults can get in on the trend too. Absolutely. I Aww. say make fashion oh, a family this affair so this good. summer. This is so much fun. I really love the idea of asking your kids what their favorite animals are and incorporating it into your outfit. Aww. Dylan, I could totally see your boys in this. I know. I was thinking the same thing. It's so much fun. <laughs> and then also you can go on Amazon and get some great beach accessories like a beach ball Ooh. or a kickboard. It's just mm -hmm. so much fun and they're definitely going to have a beach, ba beach day that they'll remember. And for moms, I also feel like, you know, especially women, we have that piece in our closet that's mm -hmm. printed that gets put in the back of the I've closet. Never worn half I know. Those. Yeah. Right. Like we don't have the confidence to do it. Summer is the time to bring it out. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I just you don't know how to pull it off. But well, I, like I always how you... say pair it with neutrals. Yeah. This mm -hmm. neutral button down, neutral slides in a beach bag. This is really good for a hot summer day at the beach. Cute family. I love it. Thank yeah. you guys. So easy. Guys. We like it. Okay, so next let's talk about geometric prints. Yeah. Ooh. So <laughs> I love this for an office approved bold look for the summer. Ooh. I think it's so easy. It's really sophisticated too, but it's something that you can really play with your personal style with. Love this Zara dress. It's so Ooh, beautiful Zara. on her. Zara, I'm like, oh. it is. And actually, I, you, I know. I, you know, I can see and that. She, she knows I like want to be here, so <laughs> I'm obsessed with that dress. Yes, I'm also leaning into the trend today. This is also oh, from Zara, really? geometric oh. print. What I love about this dress is she can wear it with heels and then also like have flats in her bag and go straight yeah. to the beach after And I love work. it paired with the black belt too. I wouldn't have thought that. So cute. Yeah, it really, always belt it. I like to belt it because I think it breaks it up. Yeah. Okay. When you're wearing a heavy big print like that, I think it creates a lot of silhouette and it's just so nice. Hey Liv, okay. I've always been thinking about the sweater button up yeah. polo thing, but it's it's like I, I keep getting hung up with sweater. I get it. Mm. I totally get it. Al, this is a look for you. You could this do this. Material is super thin, uh -huh. which is what I love about it. It's very easy and breezy. Uh -oh. Go ahead. Here we go. Here we you're come. About to get touched. <laughs> feel it. Oh yeah. yeah. It's very thin. You could easily you wear that. ask before you feel someone's material. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. That is sorry. a good looking top. And the, and I the love sneakers. it. Was that okay, Zach? Okay. <laughs> I love it paired with a matching pant too. I think this yes. is just a very, very effortlessly yeah. cool look. It's great. It's kind of monochromatic. And those sneakers too. Those are, those are nice. Yeah, he can wear this like to the office and then straight to date night. Oh, so yeah. easy. I we love, love these. Live all of our models. Can you guys yes. come Everybody back? Come, Everybody on come on back out. out. All wins. And they're all something we can all do. Like yeah. The yeah. styles Nothing are crazy. Like, mm. Yeah. 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 These thank are you guys so much. I feel like you could all just like start a party right now. There we go. Just going out. Liv, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. And of course, for all these looks, you can find out moretoday.com slash shop. And by the way, check out Liv's Instagram because she just launched a new styling service. Oh, really? Congratulations. Good. Good. Thank you. Check that one out. Thank, Thank you. Exactly. All right. Up next, our pal Laura Vitale is here with two super summer recipes, including fajitas Ooh. that are sure to please your entire family. We'll be right back.
Today Food is sponsored by Good and Gather, only available at Target. This morning, we are upgrading our summer spread with two simple, fresh, and delicious recipes for your next party. Or maybe you want to make it tonight. Here with us is Laura Vitale, a cookbook author and the host of Laura in the Kitchen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I say everything you cook is always yum. Oh, it's always delicious. I can't wait to see what you're doing today. Yay! So I wanted to share two recipes that were both budget-friendly, okay. easy to make, mm -hmm. and you can also make ahead if you've got a very busy summer schedule oh. like I do. Mm -hmm. I'm using a couple little things from the Good and Gather line at Target to kind of help things go a little bit faster. Okay. Yes. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a caprese pasta salad that I'm going to serve with some grilled chicken. Mm -hmm. The grilled chicken I'm using is from Good and Gather. It's already pre-seasoned. It's mm -hmm. great. It's marinated. I don't it's have to easy. do anything to oh, it. Yes. Okay. Is it frozen? It just comes frozen? Or? It comes frozen. You just thaw it in the refrigerator and then you just and the marinade's on it. The marinade's already on it. Okay. Love the sizzle. Mm -hmm. It does great things. Now, if you wanted to butterfly this so it was really nice and thin, you can mm -hmm. do that. Could you pound it down? You can you? definitely pound it down. Oh, it I find good. that it keeps a little bit more moisture mm -hmm. if you cook it this way. Right. Okay. Um, and if you kind of feel a little bit worried about whether or not it needs to cook all the way through without burning, just throw it into a hot oven once it develops those beautiful grill marks. Okay. okay. And it's now, great. The dressing. Yes. The dressing is really easy. We're going to put everything into a blender. There's some olive oil in there. Mm -hmm. You need some fresh basil. Okay. okay. Fresh oregano, although you could also use dry oregano because mm -hmm. fresh oregano, unless you grow it, can be a little pricey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whole oh, green mustard. mustard. Oh. Yeah. And then a whole shallot. Okay. A couple cloves of garlic. Yum. Okay. A splash of vinegar. All right. Alice, Any kind of vinegar is fine. Pepper. I'm using red wine, but you could do a little balsamic as well. Okay. Um, well, pretend that that's blending. Okay. Pretend that that's blending. And then I like to add some mayo. What is it with the blenders? They never Oh, work. now one. There we go. go. There you go. Wait, you add there a little mayo to it? And then when, once it starts going, oh, I add some mayo, mayo okay. and it just okay. develops this really well beautiful, done. creamy, <laughs> okay. yummy, luxurious dressing. And it looks like this. It looks like yes. that. Mm. And then you basically add two, a pasta of your choice. I'm using mm -hmm. shells. I'm doing the classic caprese. Tomatoes, mm. fresh mozz, you could use provolone, and the grilled chicken. Oh, I find okay. you could use the chicken on the side, or you mm -hmm. can add it right in. I think adding what it in like? bulks up yeah. the dish. This way it and feels more like a meal as opposed yeah. to just a side. And if you're serving a big crowd, you could certainly do this the night before. I and love that dressing too. Better mm. and better as it sits. Yes. It's Look like an Chef upgraded Al. pesto. Yes. Wow. Yes. Exactly. Look at Chef Al. Well, this is like, good. <laughs> Isn't it good? Uh -huh. All right. What's next? Okay. So Thanks, oven fajitas are one Ooh. of my favorite things because fajitas are great, but to make oh, them for a crowd, is delicious. Sorry. Sorry. Good. To make them mm. for a crowd can be. A big time consuming. So yes. I do them in a sheet pan. You could do chicken. Oh. You could do salmon. Mm -hmm. Today I'm going to actually use some Good and Gather shrimp, Ooh. but they've got a great selection, different sizes, and okay. it's really easy. To a sheet pan, you're going to add some thinly sliced peppers and onions, and I basically take my pepper, uh, just to give you a little demo, okay. and I like to cut them really nice and thin mm -hmm. because I like my fajitas to develop really beautiful caramelized color. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want them to be steamed. And then some garlic powder, onion powder, paprika, oregano, oh. chili, cumin, Mm. All the things that and make everything spiced. delicious. Yes. What is and that then one? my secret. This is some chicken bouillon powder. Oh. It gives you a, like a great oh. mommy, salty, mm -hmm. yummy flavor. Ooh. Some garlic, toss it all around, mm -hmm. throw it in a 450 oven for 20 minutes. After 450, the 20 minutes, 20 minutes. After the 20 minutes is up, this should be mm -hmm. really caramelized. Then oh. you add your shrimp on top with a little mm -hmm. more oil and seasonings. Mm -hmm. 10 more minutes in the oven. Wait, what mm. seasonings? Just the, same as, the same, same. same as we used. 10 minutes because they cook so quickly. And I think the great thing about fajitas, obviously oh, they're man. delicious, made this oh, way with a side of okay. rice. But think like at a party mm -hmm. with tortillas, a slaw, oh, an avocado, yeah. so salsa. Easy. So delicious. Delicious. And if you go to your local Target and go and gather, it's got oh, wow. so many different pantry items, salsas, mm. tortillas, all kinds of goodies that you can serve alongside. Oh, this is great. Fantastic. I would never think of fajitas as something in bulk, but. Right. right. Exactly. It's the only easy. way to do it for a crowd because no mm. one's going to be cooking them. I told you, Laura. Right. On a Tuesday, this could this be Taco delicious. Tuesday. I told mm -hmm. you, home run every time you come. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> for these recipes, they are worth it. Just head to today.com slash. Food. And by the this way, really the good. fun continues next week. We're going to take the plaza over okay. for today's summer block party, sponsored oh. by Good and Gather, huh. only at Target, happening next Thursday, followed by a special two hour event. I'm going to be cooking up some block party favorites with chefs like Christina Tosi mm. and JJ Johnson on today all day. Okay. Scan the QR code for more information. Coming up. It's Q&A today. What the hey? We're answering some of your questions and giving a little glimpse of our early morning routines. Mm. Third hour today, I'll be right back. This is delicious. Oh my god, which so one good. do I like
always love this time when we can bring you another edition of Q&A today. It's been a while. Uh, that's yeah. right. We answer your questions and if we anything within reason. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, so let's get to it. Okay. We, we've got Kathy and Bruce from Toronto. Let's find out what their question is. When you're putting your barbecue plate together, what's your favorite side? Oh, Ooh. good one. You? I think mine's is my mom's potato salad. Mm -hmm. It's very basic. Yeah. You know, it's scallions, celery, potatoes, mayonnaise. I mean, and eggs. Yeah. I actually like baked beans. Yes. Oh, you know, a lot do. of people don't yep. like baked beans. We I do. feel like they leave them alone. Every barbecue. I've, uh, my Me? three staples. Three, yeah, uh, Bush's baked beans. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a coleslaw and uh, a Deborah's potato salad. Yeah, that's, that's it. Every one that's of them. It. Yeah. All right. All okay. Right. Cool. Our next question is uh, Shava and Mona from Austin. They have a question about our morning routines. Oh. What time does your alarm go off? And what are the first two things you do when you wake up? Hmm. Who Ladies? wants to start? For me, it just depends on what I'm doing for the day. Mm -hmm. um, so this morning, for example, my alarm, I wanted to be here by, I think I said 545. So mm -hmm. I set my alarm for 525. Mm -hmm. And I'm out of the house by 535. I literally wake up, brush my teeth, and leave the house. Like, wow. I don't, I don't linger. Yeah. How about you? People ask me all the time this question, and I'm like, well, if I'm in for Al, it's 4.15. Yeah, exactly. If I'm just doing my shift, don't tell anyone, but it's like 6.15. Yeah. Which is like yeah. actually sleeping in. But I, I'm the same way. It's 15 minutes. I can get up, brush my teeth, wash my face, make We're my out. coffee. I'm out of the house. Yeah, see, I'm 4.15, but I like to I like to take my time in the morning. I, I lay, I lay uh, see, again, I don't have kids. I know. Yeah, kids I'm tiptoeing around yeah, so the kids I've, don't wake up. I lay yeah. my stuff out the night before, so I already know what I'm going to be wearing. Wow. And then I go downstairs, have my conversation with Don Sunikas, our, mm -hmm. our meteorologist. Oh, you do that from home. That's right. I do that from home, come back upstairs, get dressed, and out the door. So how long six. is that from A to Z? Like, what would you say? I, I, let's say like I said, 4.15, and I leave the house at 6. Oh wow! So, yeah, wow. I like. I just kind of like. Some time leave, in the morning. <laughs> I also like. I made Nick's breakfast this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like yeah. that. So that's okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next question. We have mm -hmm. Addie from Ohio. What was one of your summer jobs that you have had? And tell us a favorite memory. Oh. oh. We know yours. Yeah, I, I mean, working at the ice cream shop that I worked at was just, uh, I loved, I just loved everything about it. I love ice cream, I loved working there, but when Sex and the City shot a scene at our ice cream shop, it was supposed to be like Montauk or uh, the Hamptons or something, and I got to be a part of this whole scene. There I am in the background. There you that are. That is amazing. Wow. Yeah, you win with that one. Uh, so for mine. And I wipe my nose. Yeah, I go like this. My one moment Did on they TV. show it? Yeah. And then she scoops some more ice cream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was soft serve. I didn't have just touch anything. That's funny. You touch uh, the cone. <laughs> no, it had a little you. wrapper. It yes. all worked out. Look at you now. You turned out so great. Um, my uh, my summer jobs. I worked at. I always interned at a TV station, and then I would work to get money because the TV stations never paid. Sure. So I worked at American Eagle. Folding oh, summer clothes? folding on that little board, oh, that's and I did Rainbow. Do you know Rainbow? That no. was an experience. Oh yeah. To work at Rainbow in D.C. That is what an is experience. It? A clothing store. It's a clothing store. You know, it's got a wide variety of options. It was oh. an adventure. Oh, what about you? I worked uh, for my entire high school uh, at A to Z vending during school and on the summer. What that is that? Was basically packing the boxes that the the, uh, the service guys would take to fill the vending machines oh. with candy. So you know, I did you. I, Get a and few. Uh, yeah, it was, one for it was, you, it was no. It was no accident that I was about 240 pounds in high school. So there, there was that. It, but were you happy? Yeah, I was. Ha I loved it. Okay. Yeah. I loved it. it was awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay. Next group from California. Okay. It's a big week with movies with Barbenheimer. So we want to know your favorite movie of all time. All time. That's tough. That's because tough. It, because it depends on the genre. You can't. Yeah. But, but what would you say is? I would say a movie I rewatched so many times. The VHS box broke. Mm -hmm. Was Apollo 13. Oh. Okay. And we just introduced it to the kids this weekend. They were total in total awe. And when I told them it was real. They were shocked. That's amazing. Can I have a tie? Go ahead. My best friend's wedding okay. and love and basketball, and then Notting okay. Hill is like right up there. Wow. I uh, <laughs> I would have to say uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. And Jaws. Mm. With Ghostbusters, and yeah. uh, I would throw that. You and Brian are the same when it yeah, comes to movies. Yeah, it's like you're yeah. like the same person. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Work with One him more. And you married him. Same person. <laughs> Yes, they look alike, too. Yeah, um, very much so. <laughs> All right, Maria and Sandy with a difficult choice for us to make. Mm. Mm. So we're from Naples, Italy. Is it pizza or pasta? Mm. Oh, that's not tough. For me, pizza. Pizza. 
Well, to, like here in New York? I mean, just If in it's life. here in New York, it's pizza. Yeah. But Although it, anywhere, I guess, is yeah. pizza. Yeah, and especially in Italy, you get a great Neapolitan pizza. And I love that they don't cut it, so it's just like a knife and fork, and right. you just go to yeah. town. These are great yeah. questions. Do we have one more? Okay. Yeah. Nick and Lori from Massachusetts. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Okay. Mm. Oh, that's a good I want to fly. Okay. I'm sick of air, airplanes and airports. I'd want to fly. Uh, invisibility. <laughs> really? Yeah. That sounds Because well, you're nosy? <laughs> Really? Yeah, you're just up to no good. Thanks for all those great questions. <laughs> we'll be right back. I mean, you could like fly. You could. That's it for us today. Tomorrow in the third hour of today, singer, songwriter Philip Phillips joins us live to perform. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, the newest beauty trend, skin streaming. Ooh, I don't like the what sound does that of that. Mean? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Love introduces us to an inspiring former beauty queen bringing comfort, compassion, and comedy to TikTok. Plus, we'll show you how to get in on the latest beauty trend, skin streaming. And days after Miranda Lambert stopped her concert mid-show because someone snapped a selfie, now we're hearing from the fan who took the photo. It's, okay. it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. Hi, guys. It is Wednesday. It is July the 19th. We're How right we? in the middle of we summer. We are right smack dab in the and middle. And the middle of the week. I love summer. Don't you like that? I love summer. Me I love too. summer so Me much. Too. I love the. I love everything about it. How can it. we hold on to it? What can we do, Hoda? Be our men. Be try, our guru. I'm trying. I'm trying. Aren't you just trying to slow every single yes, thing? Yes, but has down. there been anything that you've noticed that actually works in slowing down time? That's so interesting. Um, I think. I, I'm a planner, and I also like to know what's next, and I can see that happening in my kids. Like, yes. what's next? What's next? Yes. What's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? And you're like, this is what I'm going to do on Friday, and this is what we're going to do on Saturday. Yeah. You know, we have one thing planned. You know, you try to make something yes. so that the day doesn't slip by, but sometimes I think life's better if you're just 
sitting with your, you know, sitting with your kids and sitting with everything. And like they're done have to be a next. And just, I think, I feel like spontaneous things happen when you're not all planned out. Like, I like that. You, you roll up on something and you're like, let's do this. Let's yes. invite this person over. We see him on the street. Come out, you know, yes. as yes. opposed to a, a big and, old. And, and that doesn't happen if your day is so planned yes. that there isn't space for spontaneity. I like that. Okay, so that's what we're going to That's try. what we're working on? That's what we're mm -hmm. going to try today. Okay. Um, okay, so Miranda Lambert has been, uh, we've she's been in the headlines. Mm -hmm. Because during a concert, she actually stopped. She was performing her ballad, one of my favorite songs. Tin Man is Isn't one of the greatest songs. It is gorgeous. And gorgeous, emotional. Gorgeous, Yeah, it's a gorgeous song. But in the middle of it, um, she was looking at in the audience, and there were some people taking selfies. And she decided that she was going to put the brakes on the concert, just stop it all for a moment. So take a look. Something bound to fall apart. I'm going to stop right here for a sec, Danny. I'm sorry. These girls are worried about their selfie and not listening to the song. It's pissing me off a little bit. Seemed like the audience liked it, like that she wanted to. Everyone it to felt attention. like she was holding, like it felt like it really was bothering her so much that she couldn't not tell the truth, mm -hmm. which like you kind of understand, yeah. you know. But at yeah. the same time, I'm sure those girls felt terrible. terrible. Well, and also, I mean, you know, at all the concerts, you see everything's changed when it comes I to know. concerts. I mean, it's just the way it is now. You can say, well, wasn't it better before everyone had phones? Yeah, it was better, I think, just in terms of being in the moment. I didn't tell you that. I don't uh. think I told you this. Uh. So I went to go see Bono yeah. at the Beacon Theater. Uh -huh. He has a whole thing with his, with his book, Surrender. And he puts on this kind of one-man show, and it's mm -hmm. half talking and mm -hmm, half singing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, it is emotional yeah. and beautiful. And you know what they do? Uh. They take your phone. Before and they put in. it in a pouch, yeah. and they lock it up, yeah. and when you leave, you, you walk to somebody, it and it, well, you hold it on your person, oh, you just but can't they unlock it. it, and I will say, you enjoyed it so much So more. much. And that, I mean, that, and that can happen at those cool, beautiful, yeah. small concerts. Yeah, but, but it can't at I a concert like the like way that. things are, it's just, look, I mean, we've seen, on the plaza, we see it every single time, that Everybody's got their phone out because That's they want to capture the moment. It's the way it goes. Yeah, and the, probably those girls were taking a picture with her well, in the background. Well, there's actually a, there is oh, actually you can, a, you can see that perspective. There's a picture of the girls and there's Miranda in the background, and you know they got what all dressed up, went they... to the concert. I don't I don't know. Yeah. I think they said they were embarrassed or they felt I don't know. Something about being embarrassed. But I think, too, it's sort of like, and then you do it from her perspective, like, what that doesn't feel good. Then you also do it from their perspective, which is, we all got dressed yes. up. We came to we this paid Miranda. money to go We just want one her. good shot. Yeah. Let's get this shot. And and by the way, whenever you're singled out, yes. don't you remember, oh my like, gosh, in stop. classrooms, Ugh. in anywhere, you're like, you're, like you could feeling, feel that feeling. It, it starts in your stomach. Oh, I remember it. You feel it. sick. Me, too. It. Where somebody would say, she. You're, you're not the, paying attention. And you're like, oh, were they looking at me? And you can you think about it, by the way, for weeks and months. Oh no, later. I know. Yeah. It it's is so hard interesting thing. that they probably went back, those cute girls who got all yeah. dressed up to take yeah. a picture probably were their third grade self yeah. in that moment. Yeah. It yeah. looks like they were mother and daughters and, too. Uh, but I you wonder and you get it as performers, like how hard you, it must be. I, it's almost like and we've all been at uh, I don't know whether it's a luncheon where someone's giving yeah. a speech or something and everybody's talking yes. or everybody, nobody's no, there. And then you've also been in moments where you can hear a pin drop. Yeah. Like there's nothing better than it's being true. in that moment where you're like, oh my God, it's so silent in I here. Know. I can feel it. It's such a hard balance because yeah. it, I, you know, we have been at something where somebody, where you're, people aren't listening. Mm -hmm. And we, have you ever been the person like, you know, at church or uh, somebody's giving a speech and you're like, shh, shh. Someone's like, hey, speak, Jenna, are we going to yeah. go? And you're like, no, they're not, speaking. I know. Yeah. I feel that. I feel oddly, like, responsible for the person yeah. who's talking. Me too. Like, to keep everybody quiet. Me too. Or I'll be like. But it's hard at a concert. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, concerts anyway, are fun. Anyway, we see both sides. Okay. All right. We like to keep up on the latest trends. Apparently, we try to. Apparently, there's one that is we find shocking. The Speedo is having a comeback. 
Well, that is Well, a, okay, that's different. Yeah. That's not what we were thinking, okay? I mean, also, okay, he can wear a Speedo, sure. Right. Right. But, um, and some art would argue maybe it never went away, because if you go to the beaches of Europe, which I haven't been to, but if you do, there are Speedos or, or no Speedos. There are a lot of nude beaches in Europe. Well, yes, there are. There are, there are. Um, which is always such an interesting prospect. I still remember when my, my brother and I were young. We went on a, we, just, we just traveled together after, after school, and it was just the two of us. <laughs> my parents were super strict. Like, we couldn't go out after 9 p.m., but they would let us go overseas. I know. To how Europe. great is that? Because I think for them, the world was small. Yeah. Because they were from Egypt. So they were like, oh, you're But don't here. you love that you and your brother found that yeah. little loophole, and you're like, we can't even go on dates, but yeah, guess we where we can we go? We can't go anywhere, anywhere, but let's get on a plane. <laughs> um, but just the two of us. But we we walked up on a nude beach, and we were shocked. And I what? Mean, how? It was embarrassing. Well, first of all, you're with your brother. You want to just die <laughs> right there. And we were like, what's going on? We just couldn't believe what we were seeing. But you, decide, you didn't decide we just didn't, to. Oh, God. Would you ever? Well, because if you had a brother, you probably wouldn't do it. No, Not wouldn't. with my brother, but I've done yeah, it. Yeah, of course. You've yes, been I on have. Nude beach? Yes, I have. How, how old were you? Oh. Young. <laughs> how young? <laughs> Eighteen. Really? Mm -hmm. Where was this nude beach? Spain. Ah. I was studying abroad there. Oh. I just, I'll say, bring extra sunscreen if you're going to do it. <laughs> it in the were time, you, wait, it feels what? fun okay. and free. Were you egged on, or did you? Were you the one who eggs people on? I think I was. I was. Probably egged on, which I know. No, don't give me that look. I don't well, know. Usually, you're the one. You're the ringleader. You're the one. Come on, you guys, let's do it. We only will live once. Usually, like sometimes, but yeah. in this case, I think we all decided to okay. go for the day, um, and I went. You are wild. But I would just say we're extra protection. Sunscreen, that is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sunscreen, that is, because <gasps> the sun hits in parts that you never okay, see. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, anyway, it. the speedo's well, back. But it, but here's the thing: I do think that sometimes, like some people wear their same bathing suit uniform no yes. matter what place they go, I, whether I'm it's that a pool person. or whatever. You are that. I know, person, but I don't have. We don't. I, we can. You, I don't have it. You don't have it. No. Okay. But, well, there are different swimsuits for different occasions. Occasions. And you, I mean, you like to wear one piece. I like to wear a one piece because that feel feels comfortable. Yeah, feels and good. also I'm running around with, with kids. humans. But before humans, did you still wear one piece? I think in college and other times I wore two, two pieces. pieces. Mm. What about you? I I, I wear a two piece, but not because you of anything. You own any a one piece? Um, I think I have one, but I never wear it. Okay. I never wear it, yeah. Okay. All right, that was great. Okay, coming up next, a couple of things we're loving right now. It's our faves and finds coming up right after this. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? But it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. All right, when Hoda and I find items we love, we like to share them with all of y'all in a segment we call Faves and, and Finds. Should I do mine first? Get it yes, out of the way because I think. Should. Okay, so here Whoa. we go. Oh. Da da. 
All right, let's do this. So mine is, if you want a coffee that's gonna blow your socks off, <laughs> look at this. It is called Death, Death Wish. Wish Coffee. You need a coffee that's strong, but not doesn't taste bitter. Why does it say the world's strongest coffee? Because it is. It is. It's got, it's a medium roast. It's grown at higher altitudes for complex flavor. The roast brews a cup as bold as you are, a shade or two lighter than our OG blend. Anyway, it's really delicious. <laughs> Mike, can we try it? It's Katie brewed us some, so we'll give it a little taste. Okay, and this is this is the only it's coffee you Wish. drink. I drink two every cups day. a day, and this keeps me up from 3 a.m. Keeps me going until I go to sleep at night. Wow. Mmm. I like the way it tastes. It's, it's smooth, but it's got a kick. Okay. Okay, Death mine, Wish. What do you got? What do you got? And I'm sure y'all have all heard about this, but I just Maybe tried it. Maybe not. People are learning about okay. this. Okay. You would think mine's a phone, but y'all know better. Mm -hmm. It is a new game. Yeah. Um, Henry and I play Wordle every day. Yeah. But now we're playing a new game from the New York Times. It is called Connection. Oh. And I, this, I'm so much more of a connections person than a Wordle. Here, how it is. Users must find the common thread between the words on the screen. Mm -hmm. So if you did Odyssey of the Mind as a child, like I used to do, then you will love this. You select four groups of words, and it's and and you can't make more than four mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's so much fun because it's like, do you see? Can you see that? Yes, I'm so into it. Are you kidding? So I played it for the first time yesterday. Yeah. Because people have been saying play it, but I'm like, how many things can you play? I know. But you're right. It's Isn't very it fun? addictive, and, and you only get four about, shots at it. To me, it's like, I mean, I like Wordle, but it's more. You're using your brain in a different, in a different way. way. Yeah, because that's how your brain works. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Did it's you like really it? Good. I loved it. I loved it. So okay. now you have two things to play. Okay, cool. Coming up next, our pal Ali Love introduces us to the former Miss New York who is bringing compassion, hope, and humor to social media. Coming up after this. series with love when today contributor Allie Love stops by and inspires and us. We're so excited because today she's going to tell us about someone who inspires her. Hi Allie. Hi Allie. Hi, ladies. Uh -huh. um, you all know the accounts on social media that we just can't get enough of. Well for me that's Taryn Delaney. She's a former beauty queen and now influencer who's making her mark with honesty, humor and compassion. Take a look. I get people. I understand people. Um, and I connect with people, and I can bring them in and make them feel seen and valued. And I think that's my, my greatest joy. She's a former Miss New York with a master's in communication, a drive for service, and a social media following of half a million fans. At just 26, Taryn Delaney is making her mark on the world. For the longest time, when I asked myself, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? The biggest thing that, that really inspired me most was loving people and being a friend. And I'm like, can I make a career out of that? And then 
content creation kind of put itself in my path. And perhaps her most beloved creation is Denise, or Heaven's Receptionist, a lighthearted fictional character who pretends to welcome others into heaven. Oh my God, we got a whole gaggle of angels coming through here. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Beyond her humor, followers are drawn to Taryn's authenticity and vulnerability. So I was feeling blue, I was down in the dunes. When it comes to creating the content that you know is true to who you are, but also that are resonating with a lot of people, like how do you curate or create those ideas? The best stuff I've ever created that I'm most proud of is coming from a place of absolute and complete honesty, because it's also a very scary thing to do. I have generalized anxiety. I second guess myself all the time. I want to use my voice even when it scares me. One of the things you did that I found in my younger years that was pretty scary is being on stage. Your former Miss New York. You put yourself out there. It was so cool. And I always found that these moments came to me when I was the most, I had the most self-doubt. In 2022, Taryn was the first black Miss New York to be crowned in her natural hair. I noticed that, you know, as a black young professional yeah. in New York City, yeah. being on camera, whether it is on social media or even right now in this interview, I decided to wear braids. It's one of these things of like, this is my heritage, this is my culture. You rocked your curly afro, you rocked your curly hair yeah. just out there. And I competed for several years, I mean, five years, with a, a weave-in, straight hair, um, because I was told that's how you win. You know, that's how you, that is what's beautiful. I was even told by folks, like, I love your hair. Wear your hair natural after you win. And then I got to my very last year of eligibility. I was about to age out of the Miss America program. And when I went into competing for Miss New York, I was like, all right, I don't want this if I don't get to do it as me. You have to be standing who you are, what you believe, and never back down from that. That state of mind allows Taryn to explore her creativity on social media. The characters that I create or the impressions that I do are really coming from one a place of love. Denise, the heaven receptionist, she's strong, but at the same time, she's funny. What started out as a playful post quickly took on a more meaningful life of its own. One of my favorites is, I think someone wrote in to you and said, you know, our daughter passed away. Yeah. Would you welcome her into heaven? And yes. she was a little girl. Yeah. And I'm going to get emotional. I, I know. To get I'm gonna... <laughs> Me too. Your mom called you Olivia. That's your name. And one day, a long time from now, down on Earth, it won't feel like a long time up here, but it'll be a long time from now on Earth, she'll come up here to be with you. And she'll be so happy to see you. But I remember watching that video, and it was so beautiful. Just the ability to make people feel so seen and heard. I'm so honored that people trust me with their stories. They trust me with their loved ones, and that they want to share. If I can bring someone comfort, it's, it's such a gift. Also a gift is the life Taryn feels she's been blessed with, one she doesn't take for granted. We see you on social media. You're looking beautiful and stunning. And, and while there's a lot of realness to what you do, you've worked really hard to get here. The internet met me at a really exciting like highlight of my life. But before all of that, I was very lonely living in New York. I was cleaning Airbnbs, and I called my mom, and I just was like, I, I really feel like my life is about to begin. I just want it to begin. And my mom was like, your life has begun. You're in the middle of it right now. She was like, this, this is your life. I want people to know that you're in it right now. This is your journey. I am like still tearing up from How that. Beautiful. Taryn is so inspiring. Like, I mean, was... she knew her calling since she's a little kid. Like, I find that so fascinating. She knew that her goal was to love people. Yeah. I mean, to be that clear, that young. By the way, don't you love? I like the connection between yes. them. Don't you think it's super cool? Yes. I just resonate yeah. with her so much in that you know you meet someone on social media, and we talk about this often, and you meet them, and you kind of have this picture of who they are in yeah. life, but you really don't know yeah. the complexity when you widen that aperture. And she's an example of that. And also, I think it's important. We talk about this on social media for kids, you want to clean up your feed, declutter your feed, follow yeah. people that inspire you. That's so and good. And that's exactly what I decided to do. Wait, when that's I so smart because it's like if you think about who you follow or, or how social media makes you feel, if you're just filling yourself with things that aren't inspiring, you're not going to feel good. Well, and they say that everything you consume, whether it's food, social media, 
TV, movies, books. It's what you become. So yes. you get to be the gatekeeper. You get to say, you get in, you don't get in. But you're right. If you're snarky laughing at somebody's, you know, misfortune yeah. and go, aha, did you see yeah. this? That's where you're, that's the way you're headed. Yeah. Exactly. Boy, she's cool. She's amazing. I encourage you all to follow her. And since yeah. I'm a big fan of Heaven's Receptionist, you know, I had to ask Denise to let me tag along for the day. So let's introduce you to Stella. <laughs> let's see to good right, stab at work here. Thank you. All right, sorry to see you, but at yeah. the same time, we all gonna end up here one day, right? Yeah. Okay, so a couple important things to go over. Um, oh, we're getting a call right now. Already? Yeah, 777, this is heaven. I'm talking to Denise, how can I assist you? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh. Okay, I lost them. They probably got resuscitated. Oh. Anyway. Well, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, boss. Thank you, boss. Thank you, boss. You gotta get that right. Okay. <laughs> oh. Was it so much fun? She, it by the way, so she fun. needs a career in comedy. Is that yes. her next thing, you think? I think so. I think she's yeah. funny. She's very well-rounded. <laughs> if you haven't seen these videos of Denise, I encourage you to check Denise out. Stella made a little bit of an appearance here. I was not as good as Denise, but they're warm, they're inviting. You tried. I tried my best, y'all. You I were giggling. You were, like, watching her and giggling. That was I was, really... like, watching the whole thing. Well, actually, the whole video will be posted on my Instagram account, at Ali Miss Love, so check it out. Awesome, Ali. We love you. I like all your you. bracelets, by the way. What are all, what's happening here? Little Works here? Project. You know, inspiring words. We're talking about inspiring Together. things. Together, always, you got this. Oh, I love show this. Up. Show us. Yeah. Cool. Go girl. Okay. I got you. Um, okay, Ali, you're not going anywhere because <laughs> oh. we're going to oh, get a fun workout in. We're going to learn how to belly dance. Something oh, tells geez. me, Ali, oh. it's going to be. One of these be... things is going to be good after this. <laughs> Let me and Jenna. You're oh. going to learn with us. Y'all get off your couch. Let's do it together right after this. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. All right, y'all. It's time to get in a little mid-morning workout. So get up off your chair because we are going to belly dance. All right, for many, it's become a form of self-expression and empowerment, and here to show us the moves, Salit, the founder and president of Sheba Belly Dance School right here in New York City. Our girl, Ali Love, is here because we needed one dancer along with Salit. she's a dancer. She's yes. a real dancer. So, Salit, talk to us about who, th this is very trendy now, too, but what are the students like? Are they old, are they young, are they everybody? Exactly, everybody. Yeah. It's really for all ages, genders, Shapes, sizes, ethnicities, everyone, everyone can enjoy Okay, so it. tell us what some of the benefits are and any tips you have for yes. us. Great. Uh, so first of all, it's super fun. So mm -hmm. anything that makes you happy is very healthy yes. for you. And it's a very low impact workout. Yeah. So it's very suitable for most populations. It's good for your posture, your toning, mm -hmm. your flexibility, to loosen up, to feel good. Ooh. Allie, do you know how to do this dance? Um, I, I'm She's with the loosen up. I've done one class in my life. It was definitely humbling because it's not easy, yeah, but yeah. freeing. But what freeing. type of dance did you do growing up? I did more concert classical okay. dancing, so like ballet, like a lot of ballet. Okay, a lot. okay, cool. You did, okay, um, so okay. will you show us how to do this? Oh, yes. What is yes. happening? Yes, you have your hip scarves on, so okay. we're ready to go. Hip scarves. All right, all right. All right. Hips. So you can join us. First of all, we're gonna loosen up. Okay. Get out of your head, into your body. Release negative energy. Oh, get out, get out, get out, get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. All right. <laughs> 
get it out, get it out. You know, you know, Jenna. I sure do. From here, let's find our proper posture. Feet right under the hip bones, tailbone down, tailbone down. the knees. Lift the chest and relax the shoulders. Ah. And hold your hips. From here, we're just gonna bend one knee and then the other. That's it. And we keep going. One and two. two. And side, one, two, and side. And one, <laughs> and two. one, you're two. Nailing it. And one. frame the <laughs> hip. And then you're gonna go faster. Let me hear a jingle. Oh, wow. Keep it going and move the arms. Woo, look at that. And you got a shinny. There you go. Okay. Okay, now what? See, that was already two moves. Those are two. Wait, what was the two? One, oh, two, and then, and the, then the arms. Back, arms. Then the got it. Okay, so there's two. Yes. So yeah. the next one is gonna be with the shoulders. Shoulders. So open nice and wide. Okay. Oh. And you're gonna take one shoulder forward. And then the other one forward. And keep going. One, two, two. one, two. And one, two, one, two, one, oh. two. And shake, shake, shake. Just the shoulders. So just shake it oh. I, I'm like, oh. I just shake it off. Out. Arms oh. out. Just the shoulders. Be free, be free. Oh, you're a natural. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. She's a dancer. Okay, now go. what? And then you can take it forward. And oh, back. Wow. And side to side, you can play with it, and then you can do from the hips to the shoulders. What about the fingers? You're, you're you know what you are. You have very graceful hands. Yes. Oh, yeah, so what are you doing there? Just let's, moving let's them around. That. Oh, yes, that's so next. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna take the hands and circle them around. Circle. Oh, no. So from the wrist. Circle. circle. Now, if I, if circle. I can only yeah. move one thing at a time, what's more important, my shoulders? Or my Seriously, hands? I was gonna say. <laughs> The, arm, the hands it's might be putting it over the... the... But the hands, don't you feel graceful? The hands no, are definitely like the no, I Help Jenna. Can you Jenna's help me? Like yes. Okay. Ah, see like oh, that. Okay, go. now should we go. put it all together? Sure. Yeah, let's put it all, all right, together. All right, let's do it. Let's party okay. up. Yeah. Uh -oh. oh, I like the music. What are you doing? Wow. Well, just follow me. Now. There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. And then hip. You know my parents are from Egypt. I should know this. Uh, did you ever have you ever belly dance no. before? Well, one time. It was not good. And then you can play with a hand. <laughs> oh gosh. And faster, shimmy, shimmy, shimmy. Shake it. Yes. Yes. And shoulders to each other. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, now, Ali, I'm okay. not a dancer, so I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna okay. add another move. All right, here we oh, go. Let's, let's As do we the go camel. to break, y'all do that see, together. You can try to the camel. Okay. I know Ali's gonna get it. You're gonna We're think gonna of the chest. Oh, girl. Oh, wait. No, no. Jenna, we need to just observe. <laughs> yeah, step off. Wow. Wow, yeah, girl. Good. By the way, you're so good. Yeah, it is freeing. It is. It's yeah. fun. It's and fun. easy, right? It's easy. It's easy. Easy for some. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, coming up next, the beauty trend taking over TikTok. It's called skin streaming. We got some products to get you started coming up after this. That was fun. You did such a great job. Good morning, welcome to you today. What's shaking eggs and bacon? Hold what? on, I'm just gonna say it. What? Badass. Oh, thank you. So do you think you'll act forever? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> We're gonna have lots of fun yeah. this morning. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right, with TikTok trends going viral overnight, it's hard to keep up with the latest in beauty. Lucky for us, we do know someone who does, the new senior, beauty senior editor at large, Sarah Eggenberger, and she's here to tell us about skin streaming. By the way, more than 28 million views. It's huge. What I is like it? the term. Yeah, me what too. Does it mean? Well, we finally gave it a term, actually, because it's really about going back to your basics. And so consolidating your routine, you don't need to use all these products and using multi-purpose products. So instead of having a drawer full of all these single-use products, we're actually creating so multi-purpose products, right, and then sticking with the basics, what okay. you need. Let's start okay. with cleanser. This looks like a good one. This is Beauty Pie's cleanser. It's good for the face and the body. Oh. It also is going to skip a step by being your exfoliator and your cleanser in one. So you're getting so multi things in it's there? It's actually using enzymes. Oh, enzymes. And so it's a nice way to get the exfoliation. Okay. Even mm. though it's a very strong formulation, you're not going to get the irritation with this. So great for the face, the chest, if you get back acne, or even like the cape peels, little bumps in your arms. Yeah. Wonderful for that. So you would mm -hmm. use this a couple times a week? Yes. Put it in the shower. Because it's a little stronger because it's your exfoliator exfoliator and cleanser. So a couple times exactly. a week. Exactly. And you would use it at night in the morning? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. What, or. Now this is another product that's mm -hmm. a serum that you say is like multiple products it in is. one. It's called the protagonist. And just like in any good story, the protagonist is your lead character that's going to fight for good. So this yeah. is fighting for skincare systems that are simple, which I love. So it's everything. It's a five in one. It's going to so tighten. It's going to tone. It's going to smooth. It's going to soothe. It's By the way, help it's with buttery like, when it goes so on. Buttery. It's so buttery. Oh so my gosh. Is this, is this, what is, so, is this kind of the, the only thing you need in the morning yes. after you like, wash your face? We are going to cover a full morning routine by the so end of the So you're saying wash with this, you'll also exfoliate. And this is your conditioner Use serum. This, and it's yeah. a serum and a moisturizer. And a moisturizer. I and love then it. we're gonna I go love to that. another huge multitasker. Okay, so I'm is, obsessed with this. This is so good. I, I love, love this love product. This, this is so good because this is your skincare to serum, plus it's gonna be your makeup, plus it's your like SPF on, on top of it. On a weekend, so hold on, SPF on a 40. weekend, I'll put this on and after I wash or whatever, and then that's my makeup. Oh exactly, my gosh. and it's like this candlelit it. glow from your skin. Yeah. Like it's beautiful. So, but then you don't wear all the stuff. Exactly, and it's good for your skin, and you get your SPF because you need to comply. And with your, your SPF, SPF is in there. Yeah, SPF forty. So you're girl, covered. you're getting everything, it's everything in one. right here. And again, like if it doesn't like look, it's like a little it. bit oh, of a thing. Yeah. It's got some coverage it's too. Yeah, really pretty. It's a very vibrant, pretty. very like beautiful finish. Okay, how, let's brighten up. We need a pop of color, right? Yeah. So we got our foundation, oh, our SPF. It's another cream. Mally, another you're cream. really into this. I'm into these creams. So good for your. So much it better. It just helps you to get that lip from within yeah. below. Also, easy to apply. So yeah, you just pop this on. So is this for like lips? Your cheeks, for everything. Eyes, lips. You're all done, right? One thing and done. No brush needed. Wait, look at you. Everything. Look yeah. at you. Just. So I just apply it all over here. Are you? Look at that. Like, it just gives that glow, and that's also the foundation too. The Ilia foundation yeah. on my skin. It's like that's it shows kind of, like, you just that work. You Picture your makeup bag yes. right now. Two things. Nothing's in it barely. You're not fishing around. Yes. Okay, and behold, Next. a brush. It's a full Wow. It's got everything in it. Everything in it. Wait, so look at the you're pieces. Not, look so at the pieces. Like a puzzle. This is how it comes together. Okay. It just pops apart. And you have everything, your concealer, your brow, your shadow. By the way, that's and very your cool. contour. Wait, everything look. right here. That's, that's so and cool. This is also really good dense hairs. They're soft. And so not only is it convenient, Doesn't but fall it's apart. also going to be a good okay, brush. But this imagine is the one. like putting this in your makeup bag and then that's it. You Done. have a million yes. brushes. Right. right. And okay. it comes with a little bag that you can actually store Bring it in. Bring us the home, plan. girl. Okay, final. The eyes. And so when it comes to the eyes. Ooh, look at this. Oh, mascara. this is mascara. We gotta get to this. The brows, grande brow. Oh, yeah. So your brows are like little anti-aging yeah. soldiers because because when you do it well, your brows just lift and yes, open your eyes. Yes. So you're gonna get your tint and your serum in here so you get full brows and color and it's gonna stay in place. Then you have the mascara that's actually a brow or a mascara that's gonna give you the lengthening and the strengthening. It's a serum <gasps> plus a tubing mascara in one. Wait, tubing. So this, the Everything. serum tubing meaning mascara. Wait, it helps tubing it grow. is the kind also when you take it off, you can just feel yes, it. And it comes right off. It's so the, it's gentler on your eyes and you get longer lashes when you use a tubing because it actually feels like yes. a little on your eyes. But also, are you saying the serum helps your lash grow? Yes. Isn't that amazing? So you're oh also God. strengthening where your have you been? <laughs> no, where have you been? We need you. Honestly, where All have of these products were great. Time. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you, thank Sarah. Donna. And you thank can get you. any of these products. You probably should at today.com slash shop. Coming up next, he's a Grammy-winning artist with a new album and a new sound. Dante Bo treats us to his summertime single coming up after this. This is amazing. Oh, By the way, every day. I love this one.
Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh. You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs> The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Dante Bo made history as the first artist ever to have the most Grammy nominations in gospel and Christian music at the same time. How amazing. Now Dante's out with a new self-titled album, and he's about to perform one of his new songs for us featuring Vic Minza. Yes, Dante, yes. We love you, Dante. You? We I'm love so you. I'm so glad to be here. Seeing you guys in person, it's a dream come true. <laughs> okay, you got to tell us about this journey you've been on. It's super yeah. awesome. And yeah. super honest. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure, for sure. I mean, I pride myself on being very honest and trying to be vulnerable as I can with my fans, and I think I think this album is going to be a super, just a reflection of just my entire journey in yeah. general. How did it come? How, sometimes music comes easy to write sure. or, and to work on, and sometimes it's a little more difficult. How did this, did this just flow out? Honestly, it did just flow out because I was in such a creative season. You know, <laughs> when you go through something traumatic or when you go through anything, you know, it kind of just lets the creativity comes, e it just comes easier, yeah. you know, na more natural. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things I think fans love about you is that, as Hoda said, you're honest, you're vulnerable. You talk mm -hmm. about the light and the dark. Yeah. Exactly. How, how, what do people say to you about that? I mean, sometimes they have an issue with it, but I believe it helps those that it needs to help. And so I just try to stay true to the calling on my life. Well, I yeah. think they always say, like, God comes in through the cracks in your totally. life. Totally. So you got to you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be laid bare, yes. and right? And shiny. And sometimes things are ugly, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, right. you're about to perform. Yeah, what's the song? It's called Breaking All My Rules, and it's with <gasps> Big Mensa. Okay, I already we can't like wait. it. Take it away. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We've got so much in common. I hope that it don't fall apart. And don't you go running. Cause I'm not gonna break your heart. Oh, you're the life of the body. You know you're not just anybody. And when you're pulling me closer, I oh, we don't need to talk about it too much. Already knew from the start what we wanted. Let it linger around and kiss dangerous. But that's something we'll never do. Cause you got me breaking all of my rules. Wanting to be together with you. It's something that I said I wouldn't do. But when you find it out, I guess sometimes you fall. How I feel, baby, it's only me and you. You got me breaking all of my rules. Oh, I'm all the one you want, and and I'm all the one you need. I make out a promise, I'ma love you, and that's what I'm gonna do with you. Hey, Cause you're the life of the party. You know you're not just anybody, and when you. That I said I wouldn't do But when you find it all uh, I guess sometimes you fall And every chance that I get I'ma let you know how I feel Baby, it's only me and you My big brother, big mister Talk to him You got me confessing all of my love After like two weeks Copping you two threes And diamond necklaces with two Vs Kicking it with your group of friends and cutting off my groupies. Tripping it out to New Orleans, yeah. Throwing it like Drew Brees. You even got my group keys. I got it, man. Know what you're thinking about when your body a little. Money in up, your body a dream. I gotta say, shout it legit. Got me on 10, got me online. Watching your friends, doing my research. Doing my research as soon as I meet her. Like, damn, damn, damn. I'm making introductions, taking you, you home to mama. mama. Got me putting my bill money together to show you honor. Got me on the anxious on a real shit show. And it's all because of Cause you got me breaking us. all of my rules. Wanting to be together with you. It's something that I said I wouldn't do. But when you find
running out. I guess sometimes you fall. And every chance that I get, I'ma let you know how I feel. Baby, it's only me and you. You got me breaking all of my rules. Oh, 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 oh. my new self-titled album out this Friday. Dante Bo, Big Mensa, breaking all my rules. Let's go. This is Allie. This is our friend Allie. Oh my that God. was amazing. Oh my Thank God. you. Wow. That was incredible. By the way, so, so good. Full of joy. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. I loved it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We're full. All right. Dante Bo's self titled album drops Friday. Get it, y'all. Get it. Get, get, it, get, get it. it. And we'll be back right after that. That was so That was awesome. amazing, y'all. So what joyful. Hair makeovers with Hollywood's main man, Chris Appleton. Oh, I saw what you did there. And it's Taco Thursday. What? With Chef Michael Simone. Plus, how to manage your money with the help of guys from Earn Your Leisure. All right, you know what? Oh, geez. Today is Wednesday. Well, we that means you're the calendar. Way. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomp and grind of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you gotta think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and you can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm.
crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley's Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five cans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking in somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking, and I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were going to end up here? You were going to be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So. The pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 30, 
33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities. But you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's Mom. really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So, besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? I mean, I'm I know. with her. She won't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big and ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. 
and in fact it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it been pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do, and got nobody tell you go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. There's not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance of more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing 
remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And, and it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up-and-coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have uh, family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you had people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in, in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. 
Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm gonna grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him. I said, you don't have to follow to the letter. You know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. I typically, uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Okay. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit at a time. Cause I don't wanna put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's she's stay by me, I like this. <laughs> I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um. Well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, throw in your hand. Kind of street food. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right. Well, exactly. You know. <laughs> Yeah, because that's, that's you can take it with you, but if it's not right, taste good, right, exactly. you know, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, we want to take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we want to put a little bit more in. 
Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that's perfect right there. That's perfect, right. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. And what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, and Lurie, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these yeah. bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You have to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I did. Make sure and it's having Chris around the edges and then things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fly on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally? So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alf, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake. Tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons 
how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter. But it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where did this come from? I, yes, I cook my own food. You know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012. And his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for? Curry chicken and rice. And he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing. Don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, were, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next oh. morning. I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something dollars. And the next day I make $80 something dollars. And I say, OK, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Your chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little. Let me hear. Kim, were you nervous? Oh about yeah, that? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different, and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said. I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know. One day it might be just me and you. You're going to show right. me how to cut this meat.
chicken and axe there. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. yes. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern, and she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail, and she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious, and I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> right. the, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Oh, Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's of like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper. I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call. You have a Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. And this is what we pour on it last. Give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up. Make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. You normally, if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh, yeah. You see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't even cook. It smells, it smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This, what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce mm. that I made. Whoa. OK, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I have my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I got to try that. Oh, that's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you'll see these little pots. Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did. Who would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. 
my mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it is it, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not gonna even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand, working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam and turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom like right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen, 
with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> In 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi dược biên á, thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn. Nhưng mà qua được tới ấy rồi đoàn tụ gia đình đó thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp đợi mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Ann still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Ann agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hai hát với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. <laughs> thì lại giờ cho con được là ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hát cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes. Um, and that is because of the, you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi. Thầy thấy nó tự xúc động rồi mình ấy vậy thôi chứ mẹ đâu có biết sao giờ. Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được thì ngày nào thì hãy ấy vậy thôi. Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero.
Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yune Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here. We give them the food. They said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining, and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands. You can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was uh, one who hooked me up. To this. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesha's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare. When it's uh, done right, that's probably the best dish in the world. There's a ground beef and mix with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I uh, think we're going to fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only 3 or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food is not takeout, so we have to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel 
pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot, and they're part of the reason why we're still around. So I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do. He covered the same thing. He cannot cook, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chef, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. You scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington Candy Shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn-of-the-century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002. But they weren't sure what to do with the storefront. 
until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love, and frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we have the invention of Philadelphia-style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker. And he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. We're proud to be here today. Bassett's was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women, to have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary 
during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> <laughs> and see. Ya. We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, it's nice to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in D.C. for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, 
And that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, yeah. this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. Not to Harlem, not to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes. Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Bumford's small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference and they were like, hey, she's opening an Abbey Ice Cream shop. This is crazy. And they're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tom Ford. Tom Ford was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop, but after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Ford's that are talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, th I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with Little League kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? Like, like, like.
it's time for Sunday School. Say amen, say hallelujah. <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> my Sunday School teachers at Harlem Sugar Hill Creamery kicked off my lesson with a special treat, a one-of-a-kind flavor made just for me. You should learn to scoop with your own, my own flavor. Your own flavor. My own flavor. Yeah. Wow. All of the ice cream served at Sugar Hill Creamery is small batch, each flavor taking two days from start to finish. The difference between a small batch and large batch is one is a freezer. These machines allow more experimentation with mix-ins. The reason why it's homemade and why it's better to use a small batch, for example, is you have freedom to do whatever the hell you want. You're not beholden to what can fit into a automated machine that, like, for example, can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or it'll jam something, you know, things like that. And now, back to Sunday school. So what's my flavor? So your flavor, so we've heard around the way uh -huh. that, you, uh, that you're, a friend, you're a fan of cookies and cream. I am. Also, you like sweet potato pie. So I do. Okay, so this is a combination. And pecans. Of, well, right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie. But, but yeah. yes. I can tell you guys are married. <laughs> For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding Nilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust or pecan, Ooh. Uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with, basically it's a holiday IPA, mm -hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blend it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow, a lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta da! Right. So the cup, now we'll get a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. almost, oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, 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 look, now good. you're going to form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're, mm -hmm. now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually. Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, Your Neck of the Woods. Oh, I like it. it is. <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. You're smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas known for its colorful creations.
You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults, it's funny, they would share. <laughs> in Las Vegas, a few miles off the strip, is the flashy, fabulous, and insta-famous ice cream shop, Creamberry, opened in 2016 by husband and wife team Danny and Rosalina C, hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe. We set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy, innovative desserts into one place. For Danny, it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruits on top for the shaved ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino hala halo. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday burrito. It. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not gonna come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. Luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. 
For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkle candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh yeah, maybe not too much, it's maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. Most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coney's in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So, what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit-style Coney, in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Ow. Hi, good to see oh, you again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from 
Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis, setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek. Now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gus and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kuros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. We that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. They were Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili is a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America, and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. 
So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learn how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get pork, beef, and, a, and that's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. And That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right. So we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to... I want to watch the top. Okay. Give it a little mix. Little, this is that... Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All right, more? It's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go with it. you want the in. chili to go Yeah, in. you want the chili. You want it, yeah. I want that you chili. Don't chintz out on Get that chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier for oh, you to pour over there. All right. It. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. A mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready? They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey now. Life changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth.
Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loads. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25-ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here 
they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back at family members and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> you're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all-vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were going to open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. 
So I asked her why she thought I was gonna open a vegan restaurant. And she said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with his food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to it would as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? beyond uh, crumble, uh -huh. a plain beyond crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give it a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us. But it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay.
I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crap. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping ground of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices, and you just start whacking that bad boy and get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region, but here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me, I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley's Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley's Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, It's like walking to somebody's home that's, they're, they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel, oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people, we were here 20 years, it's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a 
smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. Well, a tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents, so. The pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, a uh, week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's Mom. really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? I sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big and ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living 
pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. How are they biting today? This morning it's been pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and have nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I'll be 15, and I've been at it ever since. 
Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got other jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it would be no chance no more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And, and it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. 
I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, love crab, crab is king in Baltimore. So um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that, and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I've um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that uh, people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, 
egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you wanna do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. Because I don't want to put too much. Right. Just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep. I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's stay <laughs> bad, I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh-huh. I'm gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why, why, why do you think this, this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant, the most popular? Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and then you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand and, and eat. Food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right. Well, exactly. you know, <laughs> yeah, because you can take it with you, but if it's not right, tasty, right, right, exactly. right. Uh, come back for it. Yeah. So what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab, still on like a, yeah, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Here you go. Is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Was faster than what I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, the natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You have to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure they crisp around the edges and things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry on one particular side too much. And, want to even fry. Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made. And this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet. It has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah. And I try the piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alf, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family.
When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food city.